It is my pleasure now to invite uh, Mr. Ho Sung Lee, the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to give his keynote address. Mr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Excellencies, and dear colleagues. Uh, I wish to thank very much the IAEA uh, for organizing this very timely and important uh, conference. Nuclear power currently supplies about 11% uh, of the world's electricity. And today's output, as you know very well, is lower than it was a decade ago. Uh, Ten years ago, when there was no Paris Agreement, Ten years ago, uh, when the world uh, global uh, temperature was not as high as a today's one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And ten years ago, when the world did not have the benefit of having IPCC's special report on 1.5, we didn't know at that time that uh, what is the differential impact of global warming between one degree Celsius 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius and its policy implications. And four years ago, at the December 2015, the uh, COP in Paris, that at that COP meeting, the countries of the UNFCCC invited the IPCC to provide a special report on these very important aspects of 1.5 degrees and what the impacts of this keeping the warming to 1.5 degrees as well as the uh, compatible mitigation pathways to achieve that uh, global uh, warming. Now, the, one of the key conclusions is that, as was very often mentioned uh, in, in this conference as well as also before the, this conference, is it is feasible to achieve limit limiting the warming to 1.5 degrees. And considering that, the world has already uh, experiencing a one degree Celsius uh, warming. It really imp implies that it is feasible to achieve limiting the warming uh, close to 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. It is feasible. But more important message is that limiting that warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius comes with the opportunities for a clean economy and job creation, better job and innovation and great potential for achieving sustainability. We analyzed a 21 models globally available, best top models, and we came up with the conclusion that to limit 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius, the global warming, the global net anthropogenic CO2 emissions must reach net zero around 2050. That must be accompanied by very deep reductions in non-CO2 emissions as well. Obviously, emission reductions of that scale and speed require a very rapid transitions in energy, industries, and consumption. Emissions in all of these sectors must be virtually eliminated, net zero, within a few decades. Achieving this will require a wide portfolio of mitigation options and a significant upscaling of investments in those options. The transitions required to realize these emissions reductions are clearly unprecedented in terms of scale, but not necessarily in terms of speed. The benefit of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is lower climate-related risks to ecosystems, health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security, and economic growth. Now, the, what's the implications for the energy sector transitions. We have so much relied on fossil fuel energy systems for the last, let me say, 100 years. Now, reducing 
energy sector CO2 emissions to zero by 2050 involves a three broad strategies. One is energy efficiency improvement. The second is increased electrification and decarbonization of electricity supply. As I said before, we examined a 21 models available, and those 21 models provided the scientific communities a total of 85 emissions pathways consistent with 1.5 degrees Celsius. Let me look at the efficiency first. Efficiency is reflected in the data of the global primary energy supply. Across these 85 pathways, modeled the pathways, 1.5 degrees C implies that the median primary energy supply declines from 582 exajoule in 2020, that's next year, to 503 exajoule in 2030, in 10 years, and then 581 exajoule in 2050. Now, these projections, of course, uncertain. Let me very say very clearly, it's uncertain, but, and the range increases as they go further into the future. For 2050, the range is 289 to 1,012 exajoule. In short, over the next 30 years, global energy primary energy supply could grow at a rate of 1.9%, or decline at a rate of 2.3% per year. But the median projection is no growth of primary energy supply to 2050. Stabilizing primary energy for the next 30 years while the global population and income rises is possible only with significant improvements in the efficiency of energy production transformation, distribution, and final use. Now, second about this electrification. The electricity share of global energy use is projected to more than double. Generally known that electricity is more versatile than fossil, fuel, fossil fuels and in most energy use, more efficient. Based on median values of 89 1.5 degrees Celsius pathways, electricity share as primary equivalent of total uh, primary energy arises from a 19% in 2020 next year to 43% in 2050. As usual, the ranges across the pathways are very large over three decades. But in every case, global electricity consumption rises. The rate of growth varies between 0.5% and 5% 5 per year. This is the range. The third is about decarbonization. Increased electrification reduces emissions only if the power comes from non-fossil sources. Fossil fuel share of electricity generation declines from 63% to 22% within the next 30 years. Now, this is based on the median results of 89 pathways. The non-biomass renewables offset this decline of fossil generation and most of the increased supply. Over the 30 years, their supply increases from 25 exajoule to the 137 exajoule, the average annual growth rate of 5.9%. Now, finally, about the nuclear power. In most 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway, nuclear power contributes to the decarbonization of the, of the electricity supply over the next 30 years. Based on, again, the median results of these 89 pathways, Nuclear power increases from 11 exajoule in 2020 to 23 exajoule in 2050, an average annual growth rate of about 2.5%. There are large variations, however, in nuclear power between models and across pathways. 
the pathway with minimum nuclear power assumption anticipates output of only three exajoules in 2050, about 30% of the 2020 output. While the pathway with maximum reliance on nuclear power estimates 116 exajoules on nuclear power that year, a tenfold increase from 2020. One reason for uh, this large variation is that the future development of nuclear can be constrained by societal preferences assumed in narratives underlying the pathways. A second reason for the variation is the technology assumptions built into the models. Uh, for example, only seven of 21 models we analyzed includes advanced small modular reactor, modular nuclear reactor designs as a possible technologies. In addition to electricity generation, nuclear energy contributes to mitigation of other GHG emissions in many pathways. Nuclear process heat is an option in six of the 21, mo 21 models used to generate the, the emissions pathways. Clearly, 1.5 degrees Celsius pathways are consistent with everything from negligible nuclear power to a tenfold increase in nuclear power over the next three decades. The opportunity exists. The challenge is how much of the opportunity will you be able to capture? Time is critical. So the share of the opportunity you capture will depend on the speed at which nuclear technology can be deployed. In summary, human activity has already led to one degree Celsius increase in global average temperature. It is still possible though, but challenging, to limit the global average temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the goal of Paris Agreement. To meet that goal will require the global net anthropogenic CO2 emissions be reduced to net zero by 2050, and that human-induced emissions of other GHGs be reduced to zero shortly thereafter. The strategies for reducing energy-related CO2 emissions are robust and well-known. Very ambitious efficiency improvement, increased electrification, and decarbonization of electricity supply. The available models indicate that this can be done using widely different mixes of technologies, including pathways with much greater and with very limited use of nuclear power. In short, there is considerable potential as well as uncertainty for nuclear power. Obviously, we don't and cannot know what technologies will be available over the next 30 years and how they will perform. The challenge for nuclear power are to be a cost-effective alternative to other non-fossil te non generation technologies and to deploy nuclear power much faster than in the past. I wish you success in meeting these challenges because climate needs all the help it can get. Thank you very much for your attention.